There is a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it above.
praise the Lord that we saw. Oh, there will be joy when the work is done. Joy when the reapers gather home. Bring the seeds and set the sun to the new Jerusalem. The seeds talking about are those souls out there awaiting us. Tell them the good news of Jesus coming back. <coughs> 432, just the first stanza. Let us stand together and sing that song. Just the first stanza. 432. Shall we gather at the wheel?
452 for heavenly music. Um, 
uh, please pray that all medical testing is negative, and that's from God. Okay? Okay. So let's continue to pray for him that the Lord will stand um, upon him. Um, please pray for uh, Rina, Rina Rambo, Rambo, for for um, let's see, for her to return to the Lord and for her to open her heart to the Lord. Okay. Please pray, pray for that. For her name is Rina. Remember her in your prayers and pray for Stephanie for healing of the foot. And um, it's prayer time, and also, do we have any of spoken? So we can kneel directly up, or either you can come to the front. Everything will fall into 
And this is my creditor to yes, you to put up on the one that brings both of the power of love, we ask you to anoint him as he brings the most comfort to us. We thank you for waiting for brother strong and the way we are today. May the God of all grace, who call us to be the son of glory by Christ Jesus, after we have suffered a while, perfect, established, strengthened, and settled us, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen.
Morning, boys and girls. Morning. How many of you, uh, whenever you play the game, been the last person to win? Raise your hand if you've been last. There's nothing wrong with that, right? <laughs> being last, there's nothing wrong with being last. Now, uh, our story today is about a king. This took place a long time ago, and he wanted to pick the best subject in his kingdom so that he could honor him with a day. And so he selected a team who would choose these individuals that would be candidates to be the best subject in his kingdom. And so the team, they went around looking around, and they selected four people, three men and a woman. And so they brought these individuals before the king, and he looked them over. Three of the men looked very nice. The woman, not so very nice. She looked humble, but not, not standing out like the three gentlemen. And so the king and the team, they interviewed each of the individuals. The first the man, he was known as a philanthropist. Does anyone know what a philanthropist is? The big word, philanthropist, right? That is a wealthy person, a rich person, a lot of money, and most of that money he gave to the poor people, the people who were in need. And so he built schools and hospitals and orphanages. And so this is where he gave most of his money to. Now the second person was a doctor. And of course the doctor, this doctor was famous for not only healing people, but for creating medicines that heal people and um, just saving a lot of people for his practice. Now the third, he was a judge. And this man, well, he was known for being very wise and being very fair, and also making decisions that were um, celebrated throughout the kingdom. And now we come to the woman. This woman, she was humble, and she was simply dressed. And the king kept looking at her thinking, why was she chosen? And so, curious, very curious, she asked the team, why was this woman chosen to be one of the, uh, the best subjects of the kingdom? And that's when the uh, team told him that the woman was the teacher of the first three gentlemen. And so because of that, because of what she did and taught in teaching these three individuals, they were able to give and affect so many and save so many people in their lives. So if you remember in Mark, the 12 disciples argued among themselves about who would be the first in the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus sat them down and he said, in order to be the greatest in my kingdom, you must be the last of all and the servant of all. So, what I want you to take from this is, in order to be great in God's kingdom, you have to serve others, putting, loving them as much as you love yourself. So there are two commandments. Love the Lord with all your heart, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Okay? And go back to your seat.
for 400 years, and the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, that was Egypt, said God, and after that they shall come forth and serve me in this place. So Stephen begins with the sacred history of Israel. And the reason Stephen starts with Abraham is because, remember, every Jew of that time was able to trace their lineage back to Abraham. Remember, they had said, we don't know who you are, Jesus, but we have for our father, Abraham. And Jesus had said, well, God is able to raise up seed out of, out of anyone, right? Uh, that, that it doesn't matter if you're able to trace your DNA, your lineage, back to Abraham, that doesn't matter. But the reason Stephen starts with Abraham is because he's setting the stage to link Abraham to Jesus. He's saying the promises God gave, the same God that Abraham served, is the same God that Jesus serves, and that uh, Jesus was ministering by and for. And we can learn a lesson from this. When we disagree with people, sometimes it's helpful to establish common ground. It's helpful to establish common ground. So Stephen was, the, the people he was speaking to, the Pharisees, they would have nothing to argue with so far. Everything he was laying out, everything he was saying, they would say, yep, Abraham, he came out, yep. He, he, they would be agreeing with everything that he said. In verse 8, and he gave them the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. Verse 9, and the patriarchs, moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. and delivered him out of all of his afflictions, and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all of his house. Now he points out specifically Joseph, the story of Joseph. And we know this story, but already as we look through the history that Stephen is giving, we're going to look at themes. And one of those themes is rejection. Because Jesus, Joseph was rejected by his brother. Moses was rejected by his people. Jesus, in the present day, in Stephen's present day, has been rejected by the leaders of Israel. And so he points out Joseph, and Joseph is very similar to Jesus in many ways. Both of them were betrayed by those closest to them for money. Both of them uh, were ended up being second in command of their nations, right? Jesus of all the world, Joseph, ended up being second only to Pharaoh. Uh, as Peter quoted David in Acts chapter 2, uh, David said, the Lord, that is God, said to my Lord, that is Jesus, sit thou at my right hand, until I make your enemies your footstool. Basically, Jesus was second in command only to God. Joseph was second in command only to Pharaoh. Even after being sold, even after being betrayed, they both ended up second in command. Verse 11. Now there came a dearth or a famine over all the land of Egypt and Canaan and great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance. Verse 12, but when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first, and at the second time Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred was made known unto the Pharaoh. Then, verse 14, sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him, and all his kindred, threescore and fifteen souls, or seventy-five people. Now I want you to notice what is significant here 
is Joseph was the one who was betrayed. Joseph was the one who was sold into slavery, and yet Joseph is the one who makes reconciliation with his brothers. The Bible says he sent for them. Now he could have, all 75 of them, now he could have said, I want my father and my brother Benjamin, and forget the rest of you, you sold me into slavery. Right? That could have been his attitude. But no, it says he called all of them. The Bible says that God is reconciling us to him through Jesus. Amen. That through Jesus, we are reconciled to God. So Jesus takes the first step. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. So he took the first step, just as Joseph took the first step. And now he transitions from Joseph to another man well known. Verse 15, so Jacob went down to Egypt and he died, and so did our fathers. They were carried over to Shechem and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Emor, the father of Shechem. Verse 17, but when the time of promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and they multiplied in Egypt, until another king arose, which knew not Joseph. And the same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil and evilly entreated our fathers, our descendants, I'm sorry, our, those that were before us, so that they cast out their young children to the end, that they might not live. So remember, they were supposed to leave their children in the sun to be killed. At which time Moses was born, who was exceedingly beautiful and nourished up in his father's house for three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of Egypt and was mighty in words and deeds. And when he was a full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. So now the, the focus shifts from Abraham to Joseph to now Moses. And now Stephen is going to draw a bunch of parallels between Moses and Jesus. Already we see some parallels between Moses and Jesus. One, they were both already threatened with death as they were young children, right? It was Herod who wanted to kill Jesus. It was Pharaoh who was going to kill Moses by law. Both of them were raised in Egypt, right? Uh, Moses was raised in Egypt. The Bible says that jo uh, Jesus and his family fled to Egypt because he was trying to be killed by Herod. Uh, both of them were in threat of, of dying as children. Both of them were raised in Egypt. Both of them reached a certain age, Moses 40, Jesus 30, when they went to deliver their people, right? Moses took it into his heart to deliver his people. At age of 30, Jesus began his ministry. So both of these men reached a certain age when they went to go minister to their people. Verse 24. Now he's going to be a little less subtle. Right now he's drawing these kind of interesting parallels. But verse 24, seeing one of them suffer, that's Moses, seeing one of his uh, fellow Hebrews suffering wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. So remember the story, Moses hits this Egyptian, the Egyptian dies. Verse 25, for he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. Now this is a little less subtle. This is a direct parallel. Stephen says, the people should have understood that Moses was to deliver them, but they didn't understand. In Stephen's day, they should have understood that Jesus was sent to deliver them, but did they understand? No. Same kind of thing, right? They should have understood.
understood and they didn't understand their deliverer when he was right there in front of them. Verse 26, and the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove. So two of the Hebrews are now fighting against each other. And he would have sent them at one, so he wanted to intervene and, and, and make it right. Again, saying, Sirs, you are brethren, why do you do wrong to one another? But he that was doing wrong to his neighbor pushed him away and said, Who made you a ruler and a judge? over us. Now, notice that it's the one who's doing wrong that doesn't want a judge or a ruler. Have you ever heard someone say, how dare you judge me? Yeah. Right? Why do they say that? Typically because they know they're doing something wrong for which they don't want to be judged. Right? A lot of times. And so it's the man who's doing wrong who says, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? And this is going to be a common theme with Moses. Verse 28, and will you kill me as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? Oops. No, Moses now, oh, oh, okay, they know about that. I better get out of here. Right? Verse 29. And Moses fled at the saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begot two sons. So Moses leaves, he becomes a shepherd for 40 years. So until the age of 40, he had been raised in Egypt, he had known their language, their philosophy, he, had, he was a general in their army, he had learned, and he thought he was going to deliver them the way a general would. But God had him to learn more. He said, no, you're dealing with uh, sheep which are the most intelligent of animals, animals, animals. Uh, and I need you to learn patience, right? So God sends him to be a shepherd for 40 years and learn a different kind of leadership. And when 40 years, verse 30, were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord and a flame of fire in a bush. It wasn't uncommon to see a bush on fire. What was uncommon to see was a bush that never burned up. So after that bush was burning for hours and hours, Moses said, there's something to this, right? So he goes down. And it says, God speaks to him out of the bush. Verse 31, when Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not raise his head. Then said the Lord to him, Take off your shoes from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and I have come down to deliver them and now I will send you to Egypt. So God says, I'm going to use you, Moses, and I'm going to send you to Egypt to deliver these people. Now notice the next verse, verse 35. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who may be a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a judge, or a deliverer, by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the book. So the very one that they had rejected earlier, the Bible says that God used that very one to deliver them. He's drawing a comparison to Jesus. The one that they had rejected was the very one, Jesus, that God had appointed to be their deliverer. And they couldn't see it. Verse 36, and he brought them out after he had showed them wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me, him you shall hear. Who is Moses talking about? He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. 
If you go back to Acts chapter 2, when Peter gave his speech, Peter mentioned this very same verse, very same verse, and applied it directly to Jesus. And now a few years later, Stephen is giving his defense, taking the same verse and applying it to Jesus. He's saying, Moses spoke of a prophet, Jesus is that prophet that was raised. Verse 38, this is he, that is Moses, that was in the church, in the wilderness, or the church, it's better, it's ecclesia, or, or the congregation in the wilderness, with the angel which spoke to him in the Mount of Sinai, and with our fathers who received the lively oracles, or the living word, to give unto us. Verse 39, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again to Egypt. Just like Jesus, they thrust him away, and, and just like Jesus, Moses, or just like Moses, Jesus had shown that he was sent from God. How did, how did Moses show that he was sent from God? He did miracles, right? The, 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 the plagues, the spreading of the sea, the God coming down on Mount Sinai and sending only Moses, and Moses goes up there and he comes down with what the Bible says is the living word of God, the Ten Commandments. And in the same way, uh, Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration spoke with God directly. He he gave the living word. He in the Mount of uh, the Mount of Blessings, thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, is what we call the Beatitudes. He spoke the word of God. And yet, what was the result? They did not obey him. They did not listen to him. They thrust him out from their hearts, turned back to Egypt turned away from God. Verse 40, saying unto Moses, I'm sorry, saying unto Aaron, make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. So Moses says, I'll be right back, right? And he's gone for 40 days. And in that 40 days, they lose patience very quickly. Say, we don't know what happened to him. Why don't we give you all of the gold the Egyptians gave us? You make us a calf, and we'll worship that. They had learned that in Egypt, because in Memphis and Heliopolis, the great cities of Egypt, they worshiped golden bulls. They worshiped these golden bulls, and they said, well, give us something to worship. <laughs> and now you're going to see something very interesting. So, so Stephen is changing from the rejection of Moses and Jesus, and drawing a comparison between the two, to, to the next thing he says, verse 41. And they made a calf in those days, and offered sacrifice unto the idol, and rejoiced in what? The work of their own hands. So it went from worshiping God to worshiping something they had created. It went from worshiping God to worshiping something they had created. And now Stephen's next point, because the nation of Israel no longer worshiped idols. They had learned their lesson, but they still worshiped something that they had created with their own hands. Verse 42. And God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, as Amos, uh, the minor prophets, are just called the book of the prophets. You house of Israel, you have offered me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness. Verse 43. Yea, you took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your God, Rephan, figures which you made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Now that's interesting. You took up the tabernacle of Moloch, and in verse 42, he had mentioned, you did this in the 40 years in the wilderness. So in the 40 years in the wilderness, while they had the sanctuary there among them, that they had a place to go in public 
publicly worship God, at home they have private tabernacles where they worship idols. And when the priest would take up the tabernacle and travel to the next place God had sent for them, they would privately take up their own tabernacle, their own tent that they had made, and travel and worship their own God with them. But notice in the last verse and in this verse, both times he mentions, you made these things with your own hands. Verse 44. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as God had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. So God had given them the tabernacle to worship, which perfectly represented that which was in heaven. Verse 45, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus. Now this says Jesus, but really that's Joseph. I'm sorry, uh, Joshua. Uh, the name Joshua is Yeshua. It's the same name as Jesus. Jesus' name was Yeshua. This is just a slight mistranslation because it was Joshua that came into the land uh, and brought them all into the land of promise. When God drove out the Gentiles before the face of our fathers unto the days of David. Right? So from the time of, of Joshua till now, or till then, God had driven out the people from before them. Verse 46, who found favor with God, speaking of David, and desired to find a tabernacle or build a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. Remember, David had wanted to build the temple, and he had told Nathan the prophet, and Nathan said, great, that sounds good. And then Nathan went home, and God said, David's not going to build it. It's going to be a son, Solomon. David's hands are too bloody. Right? And, and then David said, that's okay, I'll write to him now. Right? And he wrote the book of Psalms. Verse 47. But Solomon built him a temple. Verse 48. Howbeit the Most High dwells not in temples made with hands. Now remember those gods they had made, it says of the bull, they had joy in the thing they had made with their own hands. Right? And they had worshipped Moloch. And that was something they had made with their own hands. And now Stephen says, the Most High doesn't dwell in a place made with people's hands. You see, they had learned from, from idolatry, from their stay in Babylon, don't worship idols. But at the time of Stephen, they had had another idol, and that was the temple of God. The temple in Jerusalem became their idol. What was their charge against Stephen? Their charge was, he doesn't stop speaking blasphemy against this holy place. And he keeps saying that Jesus is going to destroy this holy place. They had stopped worshiping God and worshiping Jesus, and they were worshiping the place itself, a place filled with hands. So their idol worship, in a way, continued. Verse 49. Now this is where... Stephen begins to lose his audience because everything up till now they, they've agreed with, probably. Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Stephen says, listen, God doesn't live in your temple. He didn't live in the one in the sanctuary. He lives in heaven. He just chooses sometimes to dwell with us. But that doesn't mean that he can't live without your temple. Verse 15. Hath not my hand made all of these things? So he takes it back to God. God made all of these things. Now the whole tenor of his speech shifts. Because he's been covering history, history that they would agree with. But now he gets into verse 51. And he charges them. Verse 51. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Ghost. 
As your fathers did, so do you. Why? He's not holding back. Most of the other speeches before, Peter or John or whoever was, they had made an appeal. Repent. Stephen's not making an appeal. He's making a charge. You are stiff-necked, uncertain. You've been given every evidence, but you resist the Holy Ghost. And just as your fathers rejected Joseph and your fathers rejected Moses, you reject Jesus. Verse 52. Which of the prophets have you not, have your fathers not persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one. Jeremiah, Isaiah, all of them said, Moses, all of them said, there's another one coming. Be prepared. Of whom you have now been the betrayers and murderers. Wow. You betrayed and murdered the one that they all said. What's amazing about the prophets, you go back and you read the prophets, whether it's Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, none of them are liked in their own day. None of them are really honored in their own day. But after they die, then they're honored and respected, right? They're like a Renaissance artist. No one knew who Vincent Van Gogh was while he was alive. Then he dies, oh man, that was paintings that were millions to me. It was like these prophets, right? No one cared, no one liked, no one liked what Jeremiah had to say in the day he died. But in Jesus' day, oh, his grave, they're, they're, they're whitewashing, they're washing it. And, and they had done that to Jesus, they had rejected him. Verse 53, who had received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Wow, the law was given to you by God through his angels and you didn't keep it. You rejected it. You rejected Jesus, and now you've rejected the law. Verse 44. 54, sorry. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. Verse 55. For he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Amen. Go back one verse, verse 54. It says, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth, or they brushed on him with rage, some version said. When Peter gave his speech in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says they were cut to the heart, and they asked, what must we do to be saved? When they were cut to the heart, that means the Holy Spirit had pricked them. They said, what must we do to be saved? These men show what their heart really is because it says when they were cut to the heart and the Holy Spirit convicted them, what is their reaction? Rage, unfettered rage. The Holy Spirit, depending on your disposition, is how the Holy Spirit deals with you. If you harden your heart like Pharaoh, then the Holy Spirit can come to you, but it just makes you harder. For others, the Holy Spirit can melt us and change us. They showed by what they did that they were unchanged. Verse 55. Verse 55. But him being full of the Holy Ghost, looked steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now that is significant for one reason. Because back in the day, judges, I'm sorry, kings would often be the judges in cases. If there was a really tough case, oftentimes the king would be the judge. We saw this with Solomon, with David, people would bring these hard cases to the king. And they would come to the king and they would relate their story, and then the, you know, the defendant and the prosecution would both relate their stories. The king would hear the evidence. And when he was ready to render judgment, the Bible says the king would stand. The king would stand when they were ready to render judgment. Now we saw, uh, we've already read that verse from Psalms. Uh, the Lord said unto my Lord, 
sit thou at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So Jesus was sitting at the side, the, the right hand of God. But in this verse, when Stephen looks up, Jesus is not sitting. What is he doing? He's standing. Why? Because he's about to render judgment on the nation of Israel. He's about to render judgment. So Jesus is standing to say, Israel is a nation. It's over for you. I gave you 490 years. Remember, Peter asked Jesus, Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? And Jesus said, 70 times seven, 490. But because they had rejected Jesus, their time was up. Their time was up. Verse 57. And they cried with a loud voice, and they stopped their ears. They didn't want to hear it anymore. Verse 58, they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And this is the book of Acts. We're going to get to Saul. But the Bible says that Saul, when Jesus speaks to Saul, he says, why do you kick against the pricks? Meaning the Holy Spirit has been trying to Touch your heart, and you've been rejecting him. At what point did the Holy Spirit start trying to win Saul? I believe when Saul heard this sermon from Stephen, it stuck in his mind. It stuck in his mind, and he began to ponder everything Stephen had said. He knew the history of Israel. He knew what Moses had said. He knew that his fathers had rejected Moses and and he began to be touched. Verse 59. And when they and they stoned Stephen, who, calling upon God, said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Verse 60. And kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he said this, he fell asleep. He was not. He died the same, saying the same thing Jesus said, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. They don't know what they're doing. I've said over and over as we've gone through the book of Acts, the book of Acts is like a playbook for our time. Everything that happened in the book of Acts, we are going to see again. The Holy Spirit is going to be poured out again. That was the early rain. This is the latter rain. At the end time, the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out again, and people again are going to have to die for their faith. Just as Stephen died for his, it may be that some of us in this building have to die for ours. And pretty soon, just as, as Stephen saw Jesus standing, rendering judgment, Jesus is going to come and render judgment on this world. On this world. He's going to come and retrieve his children. But before that, there will be a period of persecution. There will be, the Bible says, trouble like we've never seen before. And I pray that if any of us end up in those circumstances, we have the courage to meet that situation the way Stephen did. Amen? Amen. Amen. May God give us the power. May God give us. And just as the Holy Spirit gave Stephen the words to say before he died, the Holy Spirit will give us those same words. Amen. To speak to the judges, the police officers, the army, whoever God puts us in front of. To speak. God will give us the words, and I believe God will give us the courage to face death as the way he did. Who wants that kind of courage and strength to meet the end times? Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we see the story of history as told by Stephen, the rejection of every person you've ever chosen. Lord, let us not repeat their history. Let us not reject the one 
who died for our sins. Father, we open our hearts to you today. Please, we accept Jesus as our Lord, as our Savior, as a propitiation, the sacrifice for our sins. Let us never reject him. And Father, prepare us for the end time. Right now, things seem to be pretty good. But we've gone through this last year, we've gotten a taste, Father, of what it may be like in the end. Prepare us, Father. Prepare our hearts. Prepare our minds. Strengthen us in our faith. Remind us of the history of Israel, because we know as you worked powerfully in their behalf, you will work powerfully in ours. Thank you, Lord, for your love, your mercy, and the courage to face our trials every day. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand together and close our game of consecration for one hundred and twelve. Cover with peace life.
this is the last communion, so I'll be really joyful to be with this one. And I hope all the church participates. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you give us. We understand and respect all the things that we go through. It only makes us stronger in our faith in you. We ask now that you continue to guide us with your Holy Word, that your Holy Spirit will come down and reign upon us and guide us in the path that you want to us. We ask all these things in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.